In the last video, we started studying language change. Let's take a look at a specific example, and let's look at how English has changed over its history. English is an Indo-European language. This means that it's a member of the Indo-European family of languages. These are all languages that must have emerged from a single language and eventually all diverged over time. The Indo-European family includes major branches like Slavic, which has langu languages like Russian and Polish, Indo-Aryan, which includes languages like Hindi and Punjabi, uh, Iranian, which includes languages like Persian, the Romance family with languages like French and Spanish, the Germanic family with languages like English, German, and Dutch, there's the Greek branch, the Albanian branch, the Celtic branch with languages like Welsh and Irish. So all of these must have come from some original language that we're going to call Proto-Indo-European that must have been spoken about 5,000 or 5,500 years ago, somewhere in either southern Russia or northern Iran. The descendants of the Indo-Europeans spread over all of this territory, as far west as Spain and the British Isles, and as far east as eastern India. And over time, because the people in Spain couldn't talk to the people in India, their languages started changing and diverging, and eventually became all of this uh, variety of languages. This um, is a reconstructed Proto-Indo-European form for the word to. So it was probably pronounced something like duo. As you can see, duo became dva in Russian, do in Hindi, dos in Spanish, and two in English. So all of them, we can see that all of them are related. All of them have sounds like D or T at the beginning, which is why we think that this one must have sounded with something like a D at the beginning. So um, English is proto, I'm sorry, English is Indo-European, but it is also a part of the Germanic branch of Indo-European where we have languages like English, German, and Dutch. As languages changed from Proto-Indo-European to being Germanic languages, there were, of course, many changes in how they were pronounced. For example, these are the reconstructed forms for Proto-Indo-European father, three, and ten. Something like pater, te, decumt. In Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit, we can see that they preserve the original sounds, p, T and D. However, in Germanic, in the Germanic branch of Proto-Indo-European, the, the sound changed. The P became an F. It lenited. Uh, do you remember the phonological rules from week three? Lenition, which is the softening of the sound. So in Germanic languages, we have a lenition from a stop to a fricative. Father, feather. O-E is Old English. We have another lenition from stop to fricative for the T. Traes in Sanskrit, but tres and three in Old English. We have a, for D, what we have is a devoicing from D to T. For example, out of Proto-Indo-European decumt, we have deca, decem, and dasha in Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit. But in the Germanic languages, Gothic and Old English, we have Taihun, down. So devoicing. This chain of changes is called Grimm's Law for Germanic languages. So if the original Indo European word had this sound, it became the next one. If it had this sound, like a D, it became a T, and so forth. So there were many changes in, on the path from being Proto Indo European to Germanic. Eventually, the Germanic languages became, one of them became Old English. As you can see, a word like fish was probably something like pisk in Proto-Indo-European, fiscus in Proto-Germanic, the language from which the Germanic languages emerged. By this time, the Grimm law, Grimm's law had already taken effect. And the word was fisk in Old English from about a thousand years ago. And by the way, we can see it here written in runes. Fisk flodu. The flood cast up the fish. Um, so you can see how with these runic evidence, we know that this was pronounced with an F about a thousand years ago. The change had already happened. Old English, as we saw in the last video, was spoken in Britain from between uh, 500, 700 CE to about 
1066, 1100 CE. It was a language that had a lot of writing. It had a very rich written tradition. And from that, we know that it had a very rich case system. So if you've studied German, remember all those cases that you had to study and how you had to match the adjectives and the articles and the noun for the cases? That was old English. Sehund, the dog, would be Sehund in the diminutive, Thonehund in the accusative, Fesshundes in the genitive, of the dog, and Thamhunde, for the dog in the dative. And this is the singular. Take a look. The plural is also different too. Thamhundum, for the dogs. So it was a language that had a lot more morphological complexity and that looked more like German. It also had a different syntax. It had an SOV syntax. Mostly it had a flexible order. So that's why we saw many SOVs. Like in he hinegebide, he to him may pray. Or we schoolen ure ufele theawes for Latin. We should our evil practices abandon. And this is from where we get many older sounding structures like I the wet, which is after all SOV. Old English also had double negatives. Uh, it had negative concordance like French or Spanish where you need two negatives to reinforce the negative effect. Like in he no to gimeles tene for let. He nothing neglected and not allow, which to us would be translated as he allowed nothing to be neglected. Literally, it would be he didn't allow nothing to be neglected. He didn't find any occupied land. Literally, he didn't find no, he, he did not find no occupied land. Uh, again, these two don't like cancel each other out. They reinforce one another. Old English had very intense contact with the languages from Scandinavia, particularly Old Norse, uh, which was an, uh, Norse inhabitants came to Britain between 800 and 1000 CE, and they left a lot of words from the contact with their settlements. The contact was so strong that we even inherited pronouns. The old pronoun they was he, but it was changed for the Old Norse pronoun they, which eventually became they. Words like Dom, which was the old word for law, were changed for the Old Norse form, lach, which became law. Searu, a perfectly nice Anglo-Saxon word, was replaced with skill for skill. In 1066, Britain was conquered by French kings. And so French became the language of the upper classes in Britain for about 200 years. Britain was effectively in a situation of diglossia, where French was used by the upper classes. It was the language of writing, of administration, of law. And English was the language of the commoners, was the language for common things. This is why to this day, we have a Latinate stratum where our fancy words are French-like and our common words are English-like. In about the, th uh, the 1300s, Middle English started to be written again. And this is the time from when we get books like the Canterbury Tales. French was gradually displaced at the time. The major change that happened then was that Middle English simplified the case system. So the only uh, case that was really preserved was the genitive, hondis, for of the dog, which we still have. We say hound's bone. Um, but other than that, there's been leveling of the cases so that they all start to resemble the nominative. So there's less complexity. Likewise, there's sounds that begun to disappear. For example, these words must have been pronounced something like knicht and nicht, where the GH did have a sound. But at this time, they must have started to be phased out of the language so that they will be pronounced knit and neat. Uh, the summary of what we have so far is that English is an Indo-European language, and it is in the Germanic branch of Indo-European. It's related to German and other Scandinavian languages. Old English was a language that was very different from English. It had a rage case system, variable word order, and double negatives. English had very intense contact with languages like Old Norse and French, which left us a lot of words and a relationship of formal words from Latin and regular words from English that continues to this day. 
Middle English, which was spoken in around the 1300s, simplified its case system and lost some of its sounds like the ch in knich.